Well, merci beaucoup, Jean-François. C'est très gentil. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the 150 years since Confederation, average income per person in Canada has increased 20 times after you adjust for inflation. And that's just because we've found better ways of doing business. So it just, to me, is so interesting because it illustrates the basic economic reality that productivity growth, technological innovation, is the only game in town when it comes to raising the economic and financial well-being of people over a long period. And the arithmetic is pretty simple. Productivity growth combined with growth in the labor force determines just how fast activity can expand without stoking inflation pressures, something that central bankers call potential output growth. The Bank of Canada updated its estimates of potential output growth in last week's monetary policy report, and our best estimate is that potential output will rise by an average of 1.5% a year over the next few years, and that's not very impressive relative to history. Nevertheless, we are we're counting on gains in productivity to deliver for fully two-thirds of that. That's a lot, out of 100, you know, one and a half percent, two-thirds of that is coming from productivity growth. Productivity performance in other industrialized countries has been pretty underwhelming, as it has been in Canada, and so we're in good company. The good news is that Canada has the opportunity to make up for lost time. The world is on the brink of a new technological revolution, and innovations in artificial intelligence, robotics, and other fields could give productivity a big boost by automating an, expa an expanding range of tasks. Some, anal some analysts are predicting that close to half of all jobs in some advanced economies will be profoundly affected by technology in the next 20 years. That leaves many of us wondering about the future of work. And it's personal. We wonder what will happen to our own jobs or the jobs of our friends or what our kids should study to succeed in tomorrow's workplace. Business people like you share a stake with the Bank of Canada in these matters and so I'm very pleased to have the occasion to speak on this subject today, and I thank the Toronto Region Board of Trade for the invitation. So today I'd like to speak to three main points. The first is that we should expect a future with work for people, not just for machines. Innovation is always a process of creative destruction, with some jobs being destroyed and, over time, even more jobs being created. We've seen this process in action throughout history. My second point is that what will change is the types of workers that will be in demand. We'll need people with highly technical skills to program and repair the technology. We'll also need people to perform tasks that may never be replicated by a machine because they require things like creativity, intuitive judgment, inspiration, the human touch. And finally, Canada should embrace new technologies and their benefits while at the same time proactively managing their more harmful side effects. Policies to help businesses and workers manage what could be a difficult transition are, are essential. So are policies that address the potential for amplified income inequality and in some cases increased market power. The Bank of Canada's job in all this will be to foster the macroeconomic conditions that will help Canada adapt and grow. So I'm going to dive right into my first point. In the past couple of centuries, the world has seen revolutionary innovations. We can all name a few. I'll just name the steam engine, the jet engine, the assembly line robot. And it's the resulting productivity gains that delivered the 20-fold increase in real income that I mentioned that I mentioned earlier. That said, our underwhelming productivity performance more recently, say since the 2000s, has cost us dearly. If productivity had continued to grow at the pace it did 
in the late 1990s, our GDP would have been 23% higher in 2016. That means an extra $13,000 for every Canadian. But even as we see the benefits of technology, many of us are feeling uneasy about what automation could mean for, work, for workers. And well, fears of technological progress are as old as technological progress itself. There's no doubt that technological improvements have eliminated jobs at the sectoral level. Just take manufacturing, for instance. Innovations such as industrial robots have reduced the need for workers in that sector. If we rolled back the clock and man on manufacturing productivity to what it was 20 years ago, three quarters of a million more people would be needed to produce today's output. Well, that's a lot. But the manufacturing jobs that were lost were offset by gains elsewhere. And the numbers speak for themselves. Right now, about 82% of the prime age population is, is employed. That's about 13 percentage points higher than it was 40 years ago. And other past technological advances didn't lead to a sustained rise in overall un unemployment either. Uh, I can use agriculture as an example. And what I want to do is illustrate the economic me mechanisms that have helped us to adapt and thrive in the past. These are often underemphasized. So factory farming and the combine harvester increased labor productivity in the farming sector. And because of that, it reduced the need for agricultural workers. The higher farm productivity at the same time made food cheaper for all consumers. And that left them with more money to spend on other goods and services. And these positive effects on income led to higher consumer demand which helps spur the creation of new jobs outside of agriculture. Rising productivity in manufacturing also led to widespread industrialization, which attracted labor from the farms to higher paying factory jobs. This is how agriculture went from representing more than one third of all jobs in Canada a century ago to just 2% of all jobs today. And all that without creating a permanent jump in unemployment. Now, governments helped ease the transition away from agriculture by making some bold decisions. One example is promoting education through publicly funded schools. This helped prepare the next generation for jobs outside of agriculture, although the period of adjustment couldn't have been easy. And this brings me to my second point. Technological advances have always been a key driver of growth and rising income per capita, yet some fear that this time is going to be different. In the past, automation largely was restricted to manual or procedural tasks, but today's technology makes it possible to automate an increasing number of cognitive and non-routine tasks across a wide range of industries. Machine learning is just one way to do that. We feed computers with large sets of data to teach them to mimic the human brain's ability to infer rules from previous experiences and also to adapt to changing circumstances. I mean, artificial intelligence allows computers to read scans and x-rays with precision and self-driving cars to react to any number of situations on the road. AI also allows businesses to automate many of the, non, of the routine cognitive tasks performed by accountants, uh, investment advisors, lawyers. <laughs> and there must be a few in the room. I just saw the look. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has raised the specter of technological unemployment, and it's like the dystopian vision of an economy in which machines make many workers obsolete. You've probably heard estimates, in fact, you mentioned them, Jen, that suggest around 40% of tasks performed by humans in Canada and the United States could be automated by using current technology. Even so, it's difficult to imagine that the adjustment mechanisms I described earlier are now obsolete. They're not. An intuitive way to think about it is to observe that people's spending habits their appetite for spending tends to grow along with productivity, along with their incomes. 
So with 20 times more income, people would only have to work 20 times less than they did before to earn the same amount. That's just arithmetic. But the reality is that people generally work a little bit more than half the time that they used to, with the rest of the gains going towards increased consumption. And this phenomenon is, is observed not only in Canada, but in other advanced economies. As productivity rises, labor market dislocations occur over the transition period, but eventually new jobs are created to supply the goods and services that people buy with the extra income. The fact is, though, we don't know exactly which new sectors will be important employers 50 years from now. Who in the early 1900s could have imagined the boom in healthcare, uh, tourism, software development jobs? There are also many tasks that machines won't be capable of doing anytime soon. There's an academic expert in the area, in this area of economics, who I like to read. His name's David Otter. And he maintains that humans will likely retain an advantage in jobs that require interpersonal interaction, flexibility, problem solving, common sense. These jobs, these kinds of skills, are the skills that are used by personal care workers, plumbers, consultants, and I'm also hoping central bankers. <laughs> so what's particularly important to consider this time is the impact that technological progress could have on income inequality. Technological advances may lead to higher incomes for workers whose skills are complemented by the technology, the kind of technology that helps you do your job better. But it's not going to lead to higher incomes for those whose skills are substitute, substituted by it. The first wave of information technology in the 1980s and the 1990s is a case in point. Educated professionals like scientists and architects could use their skills more productively. Meanwhile, the less educated workers, like bank tellers and travel agents, they saw their jobs being displaced by technology. And this has led to bigger employment shares for high-skilled jobs and low-skilled jobs at the expense of the middle, along with a modest increase in income inequality. The hollowing out of the middle could be further accentuated by automation. And what's more, the polarizing effect of technology on income distribution could be heightened by what we call a winner-takes-all effect. And, and this just comes from the market power that new technologies can also often bestow on their inventors. In parts of the IT, ICT sector, economies of scale, such as network effects, are already prominent. That said, for all the hype that there is around the current wave of automation, We've yet to see the kind of productivity growth that is consistent with a technological revolution. While we sometimes see fast change in specific industries, fracking in the oil sector is just one example, economy-wide technological change can take a lot of time to develop. There's one example I really like is the first central power station that opened in the 1880s. Well, it opened in the 1880s but in the U.S., but electrification took four decades to have an impact on the productivity numbers in the U.S. And this is because power grid grids had to be built, machines had to be replaced, and new applications took years to develop. And for similar reasons, it could take many, many years for self-driving vehicles to completely displace human-driven taxis and tr trucks and buses. The length of the transition is going to depend on many factors, like how fast existing vehicles depreciate, prices for the new technology decline, and the required infrastructure is, is updated. For those in Toronto, I'm pretty sure you're aware of how long it can take to update your infrastructure when it comes to roads. <laughs> so, so what does this mean for the Bank of Canada's economic projections? It's impossible to reliably quantify the impact of these innovations before they happen. And that's why the bank assumes that there'll be no additional boost to productivity that comes from automation. We're projecting a rebound in trend labor productivity growth from about 0.6% in 2016 to 1.1% 1 .1 by 2020. But this just reflects a cyclical pickup in investment spending 
from the lows that we witnessed fo following the oil price shock. Our work right now suggests that the greatest productivity benefits will occur in firms with high quality people management and decision making processes and also high levels of human capital. When you think about big data and smart contracts and uh, robo-advisors, financial companies could be at the head of the pack. The Bank of Canada has a research program to better understand these issues. And we've created a digital economy team that focuses on how automation is unfolding and affecting the economy. And we're reviewing the measurement issues that are exacerbated with the proliferation of digital and service-oriented technologies. And, and finally, and it's a long, it's a long-term goal, but we're building our macroeconomic models to better account for changes in the distribution of income and wealth. So let me turn to my final point. Canada is well positioned to succeed in the digital world, and we should embrace it. Canada has a flourishing information technology sector and is becoming an important player in the AI field. To get the most out of the technologies, we'll need to work together to proactively mitigate the more harmful side effects that I've talked about, the transition period, the potential implications for the distribution of income. And there are many promising approaches to managing the first side effect, the transition period. I'm just going to highlight one. As with uh, previous technological transitions, education, skills training, continuous learning, they're going to be key. Universities across Canada are working with students and businesses to bring the best ideas in science and machine learning and AI to the market. There's a great local example. It's the Rotman School of Management's Creative Destruction Lab. And the positive aspect I see with these kinds of programs is that students gain practical experience early on. Canada and its fellow G20 countries have committed to supporting strong, sustainable, and inclusive growth. Trade is a great driver of productivity, so I'm a bit concerned that we're not going to preserve the gains that have already been made. The risk of growing protectionism is something that, that concerns not only me, but, but everybody at the bank. More open trade with the United States and Mexico in the 1990s gave Canada and Canadian firms access to bigger markets and therefore greater incentives to invest. Disrupting supply chains and reducing incentives to compete won't create more jobs and income in the long run. Canada remains committed to free trade, and the most recent example of that is the interprovincial agreement that was signed earlier this month. And while we don't know its full impact, and we won't know its full impact for, for some time, we flag this as an upside risk to productivity in the monetary policy report. The second side effect, distribution of income, is equally important. While gains in productivity will increase the size of the pie, there's no guarantee that these gains will be evenly distributed. This is the purview of governments who can use tools such as taxation and transfers to address these issues. And they involve difficult trade-offs related to preserving the incentives to invest while also avoiding increased polarization of income. Cross-border taxation will also be challenging given how it easy it is to move intellectual property to low-tax jurisdictions. Aside from taxation, increased market power for some players may raise important systemic issues, many of which are also cross-border in nature. These issues will, are more likely to arise in sectors where there are barriers to entry or economies of scale. An example that's top of mind for me from my work on fintech issues is related to cloud computing and storage. As we move away from decentralized on-site storage to, and computing systems, we may see a trend towards greater con concentration in market structure. And these service providers are largely outside the regulatory framework, raising issues related to adequate legal foundations, governance, transparency, and risk controls. And all of these are critical to a stable economic foundation for workers and businesses. As a central banker, I care about income inequality, even if we don't control the tools to address it. 
Worsening income inequality can lead to weaker macroeconomic outcomes and financial instability. It's more difficult for people with low incomes to weather economic shocks. If we see an increasing proportion of people at the lower end of the income distribution, recessions and other negative events could result in more financial stress. Shifts in the income distribution can also affect the transmission of monetary policy since interest rates don't affect all people in, in the same way. Just think about people with lower incomes. They're likely to be more sensitive to interest rate changes because of the potential effects on employment income and debt service costs. These effects may be less prominent at the other end of the income scale. But people with higher incomes and higher net worth tend to be sensitive to the impact of interest rate changes on asset prices. So an, income, an increase in the dispersion of income could then affect the channels through which monetary policy actions affect the economy, and we need to understand that. The Bank of Canada's monetary policy accomplishes a simple yet vital task. It manages the level of demand over the business cycle in order to meet our inflation target. But in turn, an environment of low, stable, and predictable inflation allows productivity invest enhancing investments in both physical and in human capital. And this is the perfect complement to the structural policies that governments in Canada are implementing at all levels. It's time to wrap up. If we want to continue to prosper, we have to improve our productivity. Clearly, blaming the, the machines is not the way forward. If we seek out and, ex and embrace new technologies while successfully managing their harmful side effects, we'll create inclusive prosperity. That means proactively managing the transition period and the longer-term impli longer implications for the distribution of incomes. In many respects, we have a head start in Canada. Our policymakers are working to implement measures that will achieve strong, sustainable, and inclusive growth. What you can do on your side is, is equally ambitious. Keep building competitive and dynamic businesses. Keep the collaboration going between educational institutions and businesses. And keep sharing your good ideas with policymakers. The Bank of Canada will continue to focus on what it does best, supporting the economic and financial well-being of Canada by achieving low, stable, and predictable inflation, by keeping core financial infrastructure safe, and by giving sound advice on financial sector policies so that vulnerabilities do not get in the way of sustainable, productive growth for all Canadians. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Excellent, excellent remarks. We've got a few minutes for questions. We've got microphones uh, throughout the room, so please approach the microphone and uh, introduce yourself and your questions for Carolyn. Thank you. See, this is great. Usually folks are very shy, so I've got more questions, but we're ready to go. This is Cash Malik from JP Morgan Bank. Uh, can, thank you very much for your update, and uh, you know, I love your example of how automation can transform a business. Like you, you mentioned agriculture as an example. Just wanted to get your views on, I know you've been a, um, a, a leader in, in terms of fintech, in terms of central banks, and you've been talking about blockchain, etc. How do you think that is going to transform the financial services industry? Well, the underlying technology of blockchain, uh, distributed ledger technology, certainly has a lot of potential to uh, create efficiencies in areas where, where we need them. Uh, there's a lot of silos and legacy IT systems that require manual intervention. They're not interoperable, and, and so from that point of view, uh, there's an opportunity, whether it comes from distri distributed ledgers or other technologies, to, to really improve and, and gain some efficiencies that that uh, will, will you know, be passed on to businesses and, and consumers. Uh, at the same time, we're very interested in understanding the technology better. That's why the Bank of Canada has an experiment with R3 and Payments Canada, and 
the largest Canadian banks to, to test drive it, just to see how it works. And, and this is with an application that's uh, applied to a large value transfer system, something you don't see because it works fine. And, uh, and if it didn't, you would notice right away. Uh, and so when we do that, uh, we see that there are some advantages to the technology, but it's a long way off from you know, seeing prime time when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, you know, core payment system infrastructure or core financial system infrastructure. Uh, but, there, but there's a potential. I had a question, something we work on a lot, and I talked about the talent study we did um, uh, with the construction sector and the infrastructure funding. Are there any levers within the Bank of Canada that you're using or any data that you're gathering to help with labor demand planning? Well, we look at the macro economy, and so, and so uh, we tend to look at things from an aggregate level. I mean, what we've noticed is that there's still uh, considerable slack in the labor market in Canada. And, and one area that we've focused on is, uh, is the youth. When uh, the crisis hit in 2008, we saw a continued decline in the participation rate of youth. Some of them are just continuing school, which is a good thing. Uh, some of them may be discouraged. And certainly when you look at the unemployment rate of youth, it's, it in, it's higher than, than it was prior to the crisis, and it indicates that there's still room to grow. So. Um, when you look at, when we talk to businesses, and it's quite interesting, um, one of the things we hear is that they're really looking for uh, people who have a solid foundation on which to build so that they can learn, they can continue to learn, because businesses don't expect to have a cookie cutter employee who does the same thing for the next 20 years. And so, uh, an example I always found interesting was when I was in Trois-Rivières last fall, and and uh, there's an innovation lab there that works with the university to pair up students and, and uh, entrepreneurs in the biotech area to really teach them not only more about how to use the skills that they're learning in school, but clearly uh, any kinds of efforts that increase those in the STEM areas, so science, technology, and engineering, and math. And I always like to add economics to that. <laughs> is a good thing. Thanks. Another question here? Hello, Teresa Ebden with Accenture. You mentioned that uh, the Bank of Canada sees Canada as a leader in the digital age. Wanted to get your perspective on why and how you measure that, why you believe it to be so, and how you would compare uh, where we're at with fintech in the Toronto KW corridor compared with, say, Hong Kong, New York, and UK. So I'm gonna broaden this out from fintech because I think here today, I'm talking about innovation in, uh, in areas that, that extend beyond that. I mean, clearly there's some overlap in those two subjects. When you look at the uh, number of new firms being created in the, in the Toronto-Waterloo corridor, uh, the numbers are pretty high relative to other countries when you, when you, when you scale it right. And uh, there seems to be the development of what you need for sustainable growth in those sectors. And then they could talk about clusters and, and the ecosystem that would support it. And so we can see that developing. Uh, so it's really on that basis that, uh, that uh, we make the statements like that. I mean, other countries are doing the same thing, though. Uh, when I go around uh, in my international work and look at the fintech area again, I can see that, that Singapore, uh, China, uh, Many countries are in, uh, uh, involved in, in very big investments in that area. But when you look at Canada with some of the initiatives, like the Next, Next AI, which is a global innovation hub, I mean, clearly we're setting up ourselves to be, to be a focal point. Maybe not the only focal point in the world, but, but a focal point. Thank you. Any other questions for Carolyn? Hello, um, I'm Lucy Lee from RBC. I have a question regarding business investment. So I believe StatsCan did a survey of intention for capital spending in 2017. And while the interest rate has been kept quite low, the, the, the capital spending outside of oil and gas is not gonna rebound that much according to the survey. So do you actually think this is an effective instrument to help boost business investment or are you uh, at Bank of Canada looking at other instruments as well? Thank you. So, so uh, we target inflation, and our tool is the is the interest rate. So, um, but at the same time, we look at well, what components of demand are actually going to grow that give us kind of a, a balanced a balanced growth path for for GDP, 
And, uh, and you're right, investment uh, hasn't been that strong. Certainly uh, in the oil and gas sector, it was down 50% since the, since the uh, oil prices fell in the middle of 2014. I mean, I'm talking to the right audience in the room. You all know when you take investment decisions, you're thinking about a wide range of things. You're not just thinking about the cost of financing, which is actually quite favorable right now, or your cash position. You're thinking about, well, what's the return going to be on that investment, and, and, uh, and what's the risk around that? And right now, and, and for the last number of years, what we've seen when we talk to businesses is that they're just not sure about they're uncertain about the stability or the sustainability of the of future growth in Canada. Um, they take into a lot of factors that are not related to to cost of financing, but the cost of of red tape, the cost of electricity, uh, how easy it is to find the right labor and attract them to come to Toronto or come to Vancouver or whatever city you want to build your business in. And, and those costs are going to be relative to other jurisdictions where they could build, like in the U.S. or Chile or wherever. And so it's, it's really, from our read, the combination of those costs and uncertainties outside of financing that are holding some businesses back right now. And clearly the, the uncertainty that surrounds the trade policies of the new administration in the U.S. haven't, haven't made that e any easier. If you're an exporter, and you've got a global footprint, or you have a footprint in, in, in the U.S., and you want to expand, because the U.S. economy is expanding, you have a choice to make. Do you expand in Canada, or do you expand in the U.S.? These are all very real and important issues that businesses need to, to work their way through. Time for one last question. Then I get to ask the last question. I know you work with a lot of other central bankers around the world, and I guess the question I would have, um, protectionism is being driven by mass market, but how, how are central banks able to inform the p political system as well as the mass population about some of the risks or downside of a pr protectionist environment? Any reflections from your interactions globally? Sure. Well, we, we participate in many tables inter internationally. We discuss financial system regulation, but we also uh, discuss issues that are relevant for the global economy uh, and financial stability. And in that context, the role of, of central banks is generally to stick to their knitting, to do their own mandate, while at the same time uh, providing, providing uh, sound and, and well-thought-through analysis of what's at stake and so a lot of the discussions that we have revolve, uh, from a central bank point of view, revolve around uh, you know, just a clear-minded a clear -minded view of what the benefits of trade have been, and what's, ex what's at stake uh, if it's rolled back in one way or another, and what are the channels through which we would have to adjust. And, and uh, you know, the, the point of doing that is when governments, they're the elected officials that make those important choices, they'll have before them uh, an additional little set of facts and, and analysis that will hopefully inform their decisions. Okay. A round of applause for Carolyn. Thank you so very, very much. <laughs>